um, there's um, Mahoney. Um, this is from a, um, um, a professor in uh, in America, um, and he, um, uh, he he theorized uh, and, and publicized that all significant psychological changes involve changes in personal meanings, and those meanings reflect the dynamic interdependence of our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Now, our interdependence. And our and our personal meanings is is those adaptions to change and are they comfortable for us? Are they have they been created for the right purpose? Have they been created for a purpose that would potentially need um, um, sort of more uh, careful thought, more careful uh, adaptions and integrations, or are those um, those dynamics and those personal meanings that um, they are being forced upon us. So the, 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 the aspect of change and how that, um, and how that has been forced upon us to means that we, we don't have an option of adapting to it. We've got to just accept it. And the difference between adapting and accepting is huge. So let's get everybody start to really, really start to think about what those, what, what, you know, what, what changes have we gone through over the last couple of months over the last six, seven, eight months, obviously since COVID and, and what, um, adaptions have we made? What adoptions have we made? Um, and what are the things that are stuck? What are the things that we now do that um, that are interdependent in our thoughts? Now, the interdependency, the interdependency is something um, key critical because that is the way that it works for everything. So when we talk about things that are interdependent, um, our our you know we get it we, we're, we're fluid and, 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 and nutrition and water and, and social interactions. Those are our interdependencies because we have those interdependencies with other people, but we also rely on them. Um, and that's a little bit obviously with with the restrictions with COVID. What has it actually done for this? Um, well, there are lots of key things that we now need to consider within within that environment um that we are still um sort of trying to make um sense of to a point so the psychology of change when we experience change we process it consciously or unconsciously now um it, just as an example you know our uh, unconscious competence is where we uh, jump in a car so when you become when you're 17 you are going through all of those things and what are the what are the what are the change potentials of of driving in a car well you've got freedom you've got indi uh, um, uh, uh, independence um, but there's also uh, other considerations of interdependency then around having fuel in the car but it's it is we process it consciously to a point where it becomes a habit and then that change experience is then unconscious. It's happened, but we don't think about it because it's it's in there. It's in our it's in our it's in our minds. Um, and what we've then got to be mindful of is our hippocampus is a big, huge driver for the way we manage change. Our hippocampus is the one that has the as the, where our emotives um, see us. So if we see change as a threat, um, this evokes the fight or flight response, where we under this might not be for the the, the 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 actual concept itself it may be for the, the just the the fact that it is a change give you an example um my wife recently changed mobile phones um i'm comfortable with my mobile phone and i i uh, it's it's a business contract and every every 12 months i get a new phone um and i just literally drop the sim card um i switch onto my my cloud account switch off on one and on and the other and i go through that process and let it update and then it's a new phone a couple of things that i need to do but it's essentially a brand new phone and i'm comfortable with it but i know what to expect because i've already outlined all of these all of these um requirements no, I have no fight or flight with that. It is just something what's, what, 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 what I have heard described by some psychiatrists and psychotherapists, and I think Steve Peters, uh, the author of um, the, the Chimp Paradox, I think Steve calls it, um, um, uh, uh, uses the word flow, where the aspect is a lot, uh, where it's more accepting, where it's just, it is a logical process and we just accept it and move on with it, even though that it is a change. And we go through those processes. And I know we talk about some of the aspects of change and we will explore some of the, um, a few of the theories and um, a little bit around Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and John, uh, John Cotter um, and, their, uh, and their concept of change. So the fight or flight, um, does it exist? Yes, it does. Um, is, it, um, is it a consideration? Yes, it is. Uh, for how long for some or, for or, or not for others? It's dependent. Um, and I think we, once we recognize that the fight or flight response is a consideration, we can do something about that. 
um, we can choose to accept it or we can um, 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 or we can do something about it in terms of not 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 going ahead with that aspect of change but as long as we analyze the considerations when Jane changed her phone um, she went from a 7 plus to a I believe she's got a lem pro max something or other so the guy in the shop uh, um, the car phone warehouse guy in the shop said right that's uh, all in the he said that there's your phone um, do you want me to swap it over and she looked at looked at me and I went well it's up to you if you get the gentleman to swap it over and he said my broadband is bad in the shop well let's take it home because we've got a better connection then all of a sudden the panic starts setting in because Jane is thinking oh this is going to hurt now because I'm going to have to do all the new apps and I said well no you don't to the point where when I was actually showing her what to do in terms of signing off iCloud on one, signing on iCloud on the other, swapping the SIM card and going through that process, there was the fight and flight in there. I hate this. I'm never doing this again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I keep telling her, you've said the same thing for since iPhone 1 because she's gone through. Hence the reason why. <laughs> I'm a little bit why she sort of held off upgrading. So all of a sudden now, Jane is in a, a, the acceptance mode where it is a fantastic phone. It's got a lovely, nicer screen. She's got a new cover for it and all of the things that, um, you know, that are, that, are, that are all good in it. So was it the actual change or was it the thought of change or was it a bit of a blend of the two? But the, the requirement for that flight and flight and evaluating our flight and flight response is absolutely key. So all of a sudden, it's gone from the amygdala to the frontal lobe, which is the, the, you know, the, the, the neocortex, the thinking part of the brain, is logical part of the brain, where the level of acceptance is. And I think it's that, it's that inner chimp, it's that inner experience of thinking, oh, God, I don't like this. And then all of a sudden, oh, was that it? I always put it akin to when I ask people on courses, uh, on training courses, to do role plays. Um, you have the fear of God until you're doing them. And at the end of them, you ask for more. Yeah, everybody. It's a standard response. Feedback is as such. So the response is uncomfortable, which leads to change resistance. So when we talk about resistance, and I'm, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of understanding a little bit around change resistance, because the problem is a change resistance is that we don't give it that opportunity um, uh, to, to embed in. We just think of it as, a, as an upheaval. So there are two aspects of it. What is, is it the thought of change or is it the actual change or is it the after? So we think about it from those from those perspectives on the other hand if we view the change as an opportunity we embrace it take action and make necessary changes um, uh, uh, to make the necessary changes it requires of us so we think about it from the other side of the coin and this is where we would explore uh, just slightly later on in in, in terms of um the the, the the webinar where we actually go in on uh, on the other hand on the other side of it so if we view the change as an opportunity and this is where we need to be thinking about where COVID comes into the equation because um, I viewed it as an opportunity. Um, previous to that, you know, um, we go back to the last five years when I left my day job as such um, and, I, and I decided uh, um, to become self-employed. I worked with one company pretty much for 25 years and six months. And then I decided um, to become a, a, a freelance associate and, and, and an associate of, of uh, Civil Service College. The change I went through, something that I always knew was absolutely huge compared to what I'm, what I, you know, the, the environment I'm in now. So I'm quite adaptive to change. Um, I, I've relocated my office from home to, to, to a, a separate building. I live about 800 yards that way. I think I mentioned it at the beginning of the, of the recording. Um, and there are lots of things that I've deemed to then to be as an opportunity. And I think the way that we've got to understand the COVID world is what is your experience of change within a COVID world. So what I'm going to look at here, guys, is give you a bit of a, um, an overview of what I deem my, um, my change of COVID. So um, up until last point, up until, probably, well, up until February, February, the beginning of March of this, uh, you know, my tenure as a, as a, as, as, as a, um, as a self-employed individual, as a, as an associate of, of civil service college. Um, I was traveling everywhere. I was traveling the country. Um, I was traveling in Europe. I was traveling to Dublin. I was traveling in France, Brussels, Germany, Dubai, uh, America, well, it's been India. Um, and I left, um, I, I, and the predominance of my business, of, of the work I do is, is in London, central London. Um, and I tend to use that as a bit of a hub. Um, I've got a base location in, in Chiswick, which is like a second home, which I love it. So I left 
South Wales on the Sunday, I think it was the 17th or uh, um, 16th, 17th of March, drove up to London, parked the car, um, went out for my, my normal um, a meal on, a, on, a, on a, the night before. Um, and I got into the office. I was doing a training needs analysis with a, with a client um, on, the, on the Monday morning. Um, and then I was going to go into a meeting to do some observations and then some coaching in the afternoon. And I couldn't wait. It was great. I was, you know, everything had been mapped out for me. And then I was grounded. Then I had a call. I was told to sit in an office on my own with bad coffee. And then I was, I was told at uh, half past 10, quarter to 11, um, everything's been cancelled. We are closing up the office from one o'clock um, and you need to leave. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, polite way of saying time to go. Um, I was grounded, guys, um, and jumped on the tube. Um, I had a mask. Um, I probably started wearing a mask in London before uh, before needed. So I thought this, you know, we were talking about COVID and, and it was in its infancy and what effects it had and it was a respiratory issue. And I thought, okay, well, the first thing I'm going to do now is, is, is jump on the tube keep myself safe, get into Chiswick and, and make some inquiries and, and drive home. And literally, I was grounded. Um, and then as I'm driving, it took th- it takes three hours from door to door. By the time I got home, um, the emails had come in where everybody was going into lockdown. And as the rest of the world, so we talk about the interdependence aspect of change. So we now start to think about the, the, the levels of contracts, the, you know, the, the grounding of all office environments and, and, and people traveling. And, and then all of a sudden you are in a forced change environments. Mm. So all of a sudden then I was glimmers of contracts and remaining in place, but mainly sort of coaching and mentor programs that, that were always being done on the, on the virtual platform. I, and as, as Andrew and I have joked, and with Chris as well, we've joked over the last couple of months that um, um, I've, I've really, really spent an awful lot of time um, um, upskilling on, on, on nearly every um, virtual platform that I could find. Um, yeah. I was fairly off fee. Um, I was fairly off fee with, um, with Zoom um, and with Teams. And Teams has now recently gone through a new change over the last 10 days. Um, Webex was was ooh, all of a sudden Webex has got five or six different platforms that it's that it threw out there. So I was used to it. I've got the office environment. I've got the microphone. I've got the laptop. I've got a big huge TV screen, which is what I'm looking at. Which is why a little bit of the the, the visual um, I, I tend to look up at that because it's it's easier easier for on on the on the eyesight. So. I'm thinking more physical aspects of change, and I'm also thinking, right, what do I now need to do? So game time. And I call game time, okay, as an ex-rugby player, as an ex-weightlifter, um, whenever I was going into a game or whenever I was going into a, um, a strategic um, a requirement, the first thing I've got to think about, what do I now need to do to make those adaptions and, and, and adapt my business um, from physical to virtual? Mm-hmm. Um, and we talk a little bit around the physical to virtual um, when we are actually thinking about, um, um, you know, a, a, a classroom environment um, to a virtual environment and how we can make these changes and what aspects of change that I can implement in there to make the journey for the new delegate people that are, that are, that are joining my panel. Game time. Spend four weeks adapting. So essentially most of the contracts and most of the 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 the, the training courses that we ha- that I had in my diary went went south um, and we were delayed. Uh, they were canned, but they were delayed. Um, and we don't catch up now a little bit, which is which is great because um, so spent four weeks adapting and changing the training courses to virtual. And again, we joked earlier, Andrew and I, because uh, there are lots of things that are that, that work on a virtual uh, platform that don't work on a physical, i.e., face to face classroom, and and conversely. And things like, you know, the, the death by PowerPoint to a point um, and the utilization of the visual. So we've been able to draw things and, and highlight things and, 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 um, and everything else. So invested in tech, big screen, microphone, digital camera, and intense uh, a, a training session on what, how, when, the ways of the virtual delivery, best practices and workarounds. And these things are still coming, you know, uh, it's coming thick and fast and, and you're making use of social media, platform investment. So looking at things like Teams, um, WebEx, Adobe, Google, and even Skype. I still use Skype on occasion. 
Um, and these things, um, these things are absolutely key, uh, but, you know, for, for, for me to explore. So, um, so what have I adapted? Um, so what have I adopted? So those are the things that I've adapted, had to. Now what I've adopted. So I plan time in for research. Um, so I'm, I'm continually looking at, um, at new refreshments. I did, a, I did an afternoon yesterday on, uh, on TED Talks. Um, on just spending time watching other people uh, and learning tricks of the trade in terms of the way people interact and the way people speak, the tone, the pace, etc., mm. and all things that we should be refining as 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 facilitators. Plan time to review and refresh all of the training programs. So we look at all of the training platforms that we've done. Every single training course that I've got has been switched um, and adapted to virtual, um, and actually. Um, made better than it was before uh, because we've got time. I can, I can, I'm taking time to process it. Moved all the programs from classroom based to the virtual environment, expanded my network of people by using the social tools of the modern world. So I'm actively using LinkedIn at least four times a week. I use Instagram and I've got now, what I've now created is a link between the two. So I use Instagram and, 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 and LinkedIn um, and those service then Twitter and Facebook. Um, but previous to that, um, I had no idea that you that that those those integrations, excuse me, those interdependencies, those integrations could work, and how they could be maximised. Um, and they have, and I've made some real, real good. And I'm and I'm a little bit of a sceptic to use the word friend, but I have um, because I do tend to catch up and and um, and, and have virtual chats um, fairly regularly, probably more than I ever did if jumping in the car, flying, hotel, airport. It was a very, very, um, a very, very sort of uh, uh, secular world um, for, for, for a freelance. Um, explore the new ways of working and made them stick, so I'm, I'm quite enjoying them now. Um, gain feedback from clients, what's worked well and what hasn't, and what can improve and, and, and to change it. And that's the key of it, is, is understanding what can, what can be improved. What can we change and why? What are the things that we were doing, are doing, need to do? Um, and it is driven by you. Obviously, the delegate is driven by my clients. It's driven by the, the, you know, the modern world that we work in. Um, Work-life balance is there, 100%. Um, I'm, I'm, I've never been home so much. In my previous world as, a, as an SE, I, I, I worked and traveled uh, an awful lot. And it was the, there was a regular weeks that I was two or three days a week in a hotel. I think I've only stayed in a hotel um since march probably three times maybe um and i and i and i'm and i'm quite happily being home the home has been de redecorated and redecorated and redecorated so much less travel um and, and you know in terms of the, my mind and the environment is in a much better place so my working world now what i where i am my desk guys is there what you see there is what you get, what, what, what you've got. So I've got me, my earpieces, I've got me, my, my, the iPad, um, I've got me keyboard, I've got me screen. So this is my office. What you see there is, is where I am at the minute. I'm just sitting on the other side of it. Um, and oh yeah, that's underneath the desk. <laughs> this uh, picture. <laughs> Andrew loves this picture because he thinks I'm <laughs> mad. It is six degrees up there and I am, I'm not going to stand up, but you don't need, because that is what is underneath the desk. <laughs> <laughs> nice legs. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mandy. Mandy said nice legs. Mandy, I, thank you, I, Mandy. Yeah. I got such a shock when I opened it. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was an attachment or like part of the presentation or something. And then all of a sudden, I just seen these rugby player legs pop up. I was like, oh, new uniform, is it? <laughs> That's my new uniform. I've, I've only worn socks four times since lockdown. Yeah, I wonder how many people are actually sitting in their pajamas now, or sitting in their nighty or dressing gown. Because I mean, I'm, I've got to say, I'm one of those that has been on a few meetings before and had had a really nice top and perhaps some really shocking pajama bottoms on at the same time. But hey, yeah. you can only see this part, so it's fine. <laughs> I definitely am. Bethany's coming in there. Yep, Thank Bethany. you, Bethany. Morning, yeah. Bethany. Uh, we haven't spoken in a while, hey. Um, <laughs> but these are the staple um, um, environments that we're living in. And when we talk about change, guys, we make these adoptions of change. But what does this help with our mindset? Um, I'm comfortable in shorts. I'm comfortable in the fact that um, 
I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm maximizing me. So we talk a little bit around, you know, those, those, those things that, that Abraham Maslow talks about, what are our motivators? And Abraham Maslow is a pioneer from a psychotherapist to, to a psychiatrist, psychologist, written lots and lots of pieces. I'm looking at his book now, um, which is called um, Motivation and, and, and Personality. And he talks, Maslow talks about self-actualization, the hierarchy of needs. And we talk about the basic fundamental aspects of it, the psychology of it. And my psychology is in a much better environment when I'm in a, in a comfy position. Yeah. And that is where, I, I think, Andrew, mean, you'll agree. I think you, yeah. didn't you email me a couple of weeks ago and said that you were in three pairs of socks? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. And it wasn't even that cold. It wasn't. I was probably wearing a beanie hat as well and a scarf. <laughs> and I mean, my colleagues who, I mean, will be watching will agree that I just complain all the time about how cold it is. And if I'm not, if I'm not in a good, warm environment i just yeah i can't concentrate i'm i'm pathetic really <laughs> you're not pathetic by your stretch and by any stretch you're not pathetic not it but it does tell us about our our aspects of change what we want to make um our comfort blankets and where there were our our, 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 our our environments our safe zones and we've got to then think guys about the old and the new you know, could we go back to that old way? What are the adaptions and the adoptions that you've made now from from the earliest phone to the you know to, to the modern phone that we've got, the smartphone? You know, when I, I always ask people this question, you know, in terms of um, thinking about um, you know the the old the, the new phone to the old phone. The irony is the old phone was only used for speaking on. The new phone is probably the last thing you actually do now do is ring st- someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did it the other day with a friend, um, and I and I ended up. I had the. I, I was listening to music, so the earpiece in, and um, a friend rang me, and it was like, oh wow, what's going on? And it just felt really, really strange because up until that point, I had six interact interactions with someone, mm. and they were all via Teams and Zoom. Mm. Um, and it's it's just really, really alien. Possibly is it? You know, I mean, the phone hasn't been around that long. Guys, let's get some comments in the chat box. It is good to talk, man. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I think the adoptions and adaptions that we've made going forward now in terms of the way we, we integrate our lives in because of uh, smartphones, being able to do, do the instant messenger chats and, and use WhatsApps to, um, to bring us on board. So we've got that physical, co- physical contact, uh, visual contact rather as opposed to just the audio. So let's get some comments, guys. Anybody that's, that wants to shout anything in there? What old ways have you created and why? Anything that's that, that that you've gone through from the old world to the new world? Yeah. So use that chat box. Um, I'm trying to think myself. I feel like this is all I know now. <laughs> what was life like before COVID? Um, I just got a new iPhone two days ago. Oh, I'm not even going to try and play with the new iPhone because I'm terrible with technology. Um, created bedroom in office, yeah. So actually at home, me and, um, me and my flatmate who I live with, we've got this little office area on the corner now. It's not a living room anymore. It's just full of screens and microphones and whatnot. Um, definitely use, utilize the family chat. Feel a lot closer somehow. Before it was just there for updates, but now it's a way to talk and keep checking up. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I agree. I, I, just that new iPhone. Um, I've just got my new iPhone two days ago. Shireen, you mentioned that. Um, my wife is is acceptance now. She's loving it. She can't. She does, she hates the old phone. In fact, it's in the box. She messaged me earlier. Is it on eBay yet? Um, <laughs> working from home or going into office once, yeah. once a week. Working. I agree, Mandy. I think it's nice to have a bit of fifty fifty with that one. Um, it doesn't, Jess. Um, um, one thing I'll throw. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Andrea. But one thing I'll throw into that, on Jess, um, um, is it, it is proven that you don't need to be in the office to work successfully. And what I always say around the aspects of change management and, ch- and the psychology of change is, let's think about um, if you've got that nice blend in there. But let's just think about the, the how productive you were this time last year. Mm. You know, uh, and, and oh, 2019, and you put 2019 against 2020, um, and you think about how productive you were in the office. Um, mm-hmm. Stop until you come out, but work. I find it difficult to stop working. Yeah, that's that's completely where we 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 now need to be more um, stricter in our working patterns, and maybe yeah. start to get some new habits in there. 
what yeah. things can you put in place um, to make you stop working at home? Um, I put the laptop to, in, into a case and put the case underneath the bed. So that then is out of sight, out of mind. Mm. Part of the reason why I'm in, in, in an office 800 yards from home, because when I come here, um, um, you know, when I come to the office, the first thing I think about is work. When I yeah. come from away from the office, I have no office at home. I've got a kitchen table if I need to use it. My old office at home, my wife now uses it, but she's very religious on shutting the door, locking it, and then she goes out and plays with a horse for a yeah. few hours. Yeah, Debbie, um, that's a, a good comment. I think a lot of organisations and companies now are actually thinking about more flexible working in terms of keeping the office open when workers want to go in if they want to. If they don't, then they don't. It's just keeping yeah. the door open at all times for those that feel comfortable and, you know, having that option to work from home as well. So, yeah. Guys, a little bit of research that I've done. I'm, I'm, please keep the comments coming because I, I love an interaction. It's fun. Yeah. But a little bit around the psychology. And I, I, I sourced this from um, a, a website that I use um, often. Um, in fact, probably daily um, because it's, it's, it, it's just fab and it's free. So you can create an account. Michael Curtin is a cognitive psychologist and author who in 1976 um, and uh, the, the, there were some expansions of his work done in 2003, outlined mm. a theory of cognition, which is the way your mind works, mm. your, the way your brain, your brain patterns and adaptions to it, by which one can identify his or her favourite approach to problem solving. So cognition meaning then is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought or experiences. He suggested though, that all individuals lie in a creative continuum, which we've got at the bottom, high adaption, high innovation. Um, uh, and, and high adapt between high adaption and high innovation. Individuals at both ends of the continuum are creative, just in different ways. Those with high adaption prefer to find solutions using established systems, where those with high innovation prefer to go, go beyond. Mm. They prefer to go beyond. So, what does that mean? Now, when we look at the, the adapters, seen by innovators as conforming, safe, predictable, inflexible, and intolerant of ambiguity. Tend to accept the problem as defined. What you see is what you get. Nothing on the outside. Prefer to generate a few novel, creative, relevant, and acceptable ideas. Prefer to establish structured situations. Essential to manage in current systems, but have difficulty in regrouping during times of unexpected change. So the adapters, a little bit, um, um, need a little bit of a process, need a little bit of a, um, a system to follow. They created, they will adapt it, but as long as there's no aspects of fluffiness on the outside, that is the question. That they can, right, what does he actually mean by this? So the ambiguity. And, you know, when we, when we work on ambiguity, we, th those are some of the things that we need to really, really sort of focus on and, and, and try to eradicate. So innovators, seen by adapters as glamorous, excited, and sound, impractical, risky, abrasive, threatening to the established system, tend to reject the accepted perception. Oh, I quite like that one. <laughs> Produce numerous ideas which result in doing things differently. I'm not accepting. I absolutely love that. I want to do something different. Even if it's virtual training, I still want to be different. Mm. Produce numerous ideas which result in doing things differently. Prefer less tightly structured situations. So a little bit there around about how we think outside the box. But sometimes when we thought about the box, then we want the, we want that blend of the adapters that come in. So essentially, in terms of um, radical crisis and change, have trouble handling change with ongoing or established organizational structures. There has to be that, that opportunity for free, free thinking in there. But we need those aspects of blends. And when I ask people this, then, I, the first thing I say to them is, where are you located and why? Yeah. Um, um, where are you located and why? So when we are starting to think about the change, that are, the, 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 that concept of ambiguity is, is, is quite frightening to a point where people are, are, are sort of striving for, well, what does this actually mean for me, for us, for our interdependence? So we talk a little bit then around the understanding importance of planning and managing the forecast. So we forecast what our, what our aspirations, we forecast and what the business needs are. We forecast what the commercial drivers are. But we also need to be focusing on what the vision, mission and the goal of the business is. Where are we aspiring to be? What are the things that we need for this business to function? Um, and whether they are uh, small goals, but as, as, as Stephen Covey talks, and I'm going to just pop that, um, that in there. Um, one of my favorite books is written by a chap by the name of Stephen Covey. It's called Seven Habits of Highly 
effective people. And I hope I've spelt this wrong. If I haven't, I blame being Welsh because we are you, phonetic. You hope you've spelt it wrong, did you think? Oh, wrong. Yeah, I even got that wrong. I hope I've spelt it right. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's Still the morning. It's still the morning. I'm going to just multitasking. My it's internet cool. connection went before. It, I, we knew that something was going to... Oh, <laughs> completely. That. Yeah. But these are the things that you're funny. Thank you, uh, Amanda. I think that's referring to me. Um, not me. Not, not, uh, Andrea, you're funny. As well. yeah. <laughs> In a nice possible way, I'm thinking. Anyway, <laughs> keep the compliments coming, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so... What does that mean for the vision, mission, and the goal? So we think about what our our cycle, we talk about what, in a lovely way, I like you. We've never met, but I like you. We think about these, these vision, mission, and our goals. We think about the interdependency. Now we've gone through that concept of change, we now need to think about what our aspirations are, vision, mission, and our goal. We need to think about the commercial elements of the business. We also need to think about the the the, the innovators. We also need to think about the, the the people that can drive these 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 ideas forward. But we also need to think, and it was alluded to in one of the chats earlier about you miss your team. Well, hundred percent. But there was a there was something conversely mentioned as well. Um, um, yeah, you miss your colleagues, hundred percent. Jess, yeah. Um, mum, mum, mum. But definitely, oh, there was Bethany's comment, definitely utilize the family chat so mm. we can use that from a team's perspective. And you do feel a lot closer. I, yeah. I, I, I totally get that because um, my nephew and my niece live in Manchester and my brother does. And they're obviously, they're in, they're in a, uh, the, the, lock, the severity of lockdown. I'm not 100% sure what that means now. Um, I think they're still in tier three. But on occasion, I would drop them because they're both in their early twenties. My Lily is twenty four, I think, and Josh, is, yeah, Josh is twenty six. He's twenty seven in in in, um, in April, and Lily's. Uh, but I I would drop them an occasional text message and ask them, "Are we doing, guys? Are we okay? Yeah, yeah, we're fine." Um, but the problem is, is that you would very rarely get a comment back from them. <laughs> um, because typified, they are non teenagers, but in twenty yeah. teenagers, if that's such a thing, but it yeah. is. It is. It is. <laughs> so, but all of a sudden, we get a we get a we get a weekly catch up now. Um, my brother and I, um, on occasion, um, I'll go in the garage and get my iPad. He'll be in Manchester, and we get another couple of friends that my brother's lost touch with, but I put him back in touch with. Um, and, the, and maybe four, six of us will sit wherever we are, some in the village and some scattered all across the different parts of the of the UK, and we'll have a catch up. Would we have even thought about doing that pre-COVID? No. no, not a hope. So we talked then a little bit around that interdependency and where we all sort of sit and fit um, uh, together and how we can um, and how we can sort of connect and, and the rationale be between the, my actions have a knock-on effect to Andrea's and Andrea's, but we don't see that. But that level of interdependency from an, an economical as well as um, um, as well as a, a sort of more personal level. So moving on, guys. So consider external forces and how they impact on you and your organisation and, and, and your family as well. And I think you know that old adage about you when you come to work, you leave your work, your personal work, your personal environment um, at the door, and then you come in, you're in work mode. But the interdependency of those two is that you bring one into the other. And what adaptions have you made at home? Can they work at work? And, and vice versa. And we obviously need to think about that risk aspect of it. Just quickly, um, and I forgot to pull the, 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 uh, the animations of this, so I'm just going to quickly throw this in there, guys. Now, VACA has been around for quite a while, and from a change management uh, research and perspective, it's something that I've, I think I've, uh, I've used on numerous occasions. Um, so I just want to give you a bit of a background of VACA. So um, 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 the VACA concept was first excuse me, developed by the US military in the collapse of the Soviet Union to describe a multipolar world. It's gained traction in recent years as a way of describing today's business world. The increasing speedy, rocky, and complicated landscape in which organizations operate. And I think lots of things that we can take out of this, which from a VACA perspective, in terms of how volatile is your daily work in, how uncertain, coming back to that ambiguity, ambiguity again, how complex do we make things? Are they? So we talk about can you work from home? If I'd have asked you this 12 months ago, would you have been allowed? We can't work from home. We've got risk assessments and health and safety and everything else. Right, okay, let's introduce COVID and you're forced to work from home. So all of a sudden, 
we go through that adaptive change where originally it was thought to be complex because we put so much bureaucracy and that red tape around it. Lots and lots of things around the ambiguity around change that we need to eradicate. But we need to think about what that means. So what Vaka tells us and teaches us is, is that. Um, where were we? The increasingly, yes, we, uh, challenges in technology, globalization and change in working demographics. It's more unknown than ever before and moves at a continued pace. The one thing I will say about, um, the, the, about change, guys, is constant. Since 1963, when man was first put on the moon, we have gone through more um, complex, adaptive, forced, or changeful stop than in, than in the previous three to 400 years before. Um, and that's where we need to have that level of acceptance that change is constant. Don't try and fight change because you can't, because it's there. Emphasizing again that this highlights the need for managers and their teams to be able to embrace change and see it as a process of continuous improvement and adaptions of today's environment. Now, um, as other parts of, the, of, of, of Civil Service College, but we talked about that continuous improvement where we look at things like Gemba, Muda, um, uh, 5S, Six Sigma, Lean, Waterfall, um, um, and Scrum, and all of those project management, but those are continuous improvements to try and eradicate um, um, complex and, and needless red tape and bureaucracy. So what we then need to think about is the factors to consider and that everyone has a responsibility for creating uh, um, creating a future. Um, so let's take some time to reflect on what you've gone through with COVID. So you work from home, lockdown, partial isolation, uh, people distancing. Mm. Um, I don't think I've ever been to Tesco so much in my life. Um, I, <laughs> I really, really don't think I've just been to Just to see other faces or just because you generally need to go shopping? <laughs> Just um, taking a walk around the aisles just to see someone different. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, ready, steady, cook. We've got a bit of that going on at home, um, which is not good because there's only so many, I think there's only about six dishes I can really, really make Me. that I'm confident in. So I'm getting recipes and, and, and I'm just thinking, yeah, Tesco's. <laughs> but I'm putting a mask on, I'm putting a beanie on, and all people can see them because what yeah, we've got I... in our local village is when you go in there for a pint of milk, you're there for like an hour, oh, two talking, hours. Talking, talking to them, talking go to away. the person you know, yeah. Go away, I don't want to speak to you today. Can we, can we Skype please? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can we? <laughs> oh, heaven. But remote control over the world may be more adapted to tech and the virtual. Wow, yeah, why not? Let's think about it. <laughs> so, Thinking about the change that you're leading, what's changing? What is the, what is the change that's happening? Um, how will things be different after the change? Who will the change affect? Um, um, when will the change take place? Where will it? Um, what are the people expectations? So a little bit around the ambiguity. Now this brings us into a little bit of the categorizations and the reactions that we get. And we've got the engaged, engaged. we've got belief, high and low belief. And lots of people will find these Lots of people will find these that they will fall into certain categories and they will quite like themselves in those categories. They like to think to themselves, um, oh, let's wait and see, shall we? And th th that is the point blank refusal because there's aspects of that. What have we talked about right at the beginning? That, that aspects of that fight and flight kicks into it. And then they go, mm, let's wait and see what, 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 what change is going to bring. So all of a sudden they built that barrier up. So they aren't caring what the change is. They just want to wait and see, and they go, yeah, I told you so. Yeah. Then they look at um, the follower. So they have high belief, but they, they feel less engaged, but they are, they're happy to follow. It's inevitable. They'll just run with the, they'll go with the status quo. They, but what we seem to be missing, what we tend to miss with these types of people, guys, is that, that, that inclusion in there. If we get the engagement, we've got that level of belief already in there, but these people will just come with us. But, how can they help us to change that? How can they help us to, to really expand on that change? Um, we we'll get some, then a low belief, low engagement, then go, oh, God, not again. Didn't we try this 10 years ago? Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You've got to love those. Champions, let's get going. Let's think about what this change is. And each and every one of those reactions can be the champion. Mm. We aim to bring everybody into that champion. We aim now to think about the questions that we bring in and get everybody to, 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 to champion. Um, and what would they do if they have their opportunity of change? Now that we know red tape, sometimes it can be a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it exists because it's always there, been there. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Yeah? Mm. 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the Swiss-American psychiatrist, conceptualized the five stages of grief. Lots of ambiguity around it. Lots of, lots of question around this, that it isn't linear. And I agree because um, I, find, um, I find change as quite enlightening and I go straight to bargaining and then acceptance. Yeah. Where some will go through that. Oof, no. So we talked about the reactions of change and these are, pi- are the parts of the reasons everybody will, 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 will judge each and every one of these uh, elements uh, differently. Um, I love this model. I'm a big, big, big fan of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, and, 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 and the way I always look at it is that if we get the bargain inside of it right, we have to give people those, that, that time to accept it. Um, the one um, a furtherance back in the 70s, then this was created as a bit of a, um, um, a business change. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross created that um, um, five stages of grief, which then became um, um, change management. Then John Cotter uh, introduced his model in the 70s, which is still used today. I use this continually um, with, with, uh, with people, with myself, with my wife, yeah, with family, um, because I know people are going to go through these stages when things happen. So what that allows me to do is, is to create that level of empathy because um, I always look at stage six as being optimum. Um, so we look at the create a sense of urgency. Why are we doing this change? What is the purpose of it? Form a coalition. You know, you get the you get people on board. So we talk about the reactions. How can we introduce the the, the non-believers, the and the low engagers? How can we get them engaged but bring their belief up? Include them, get them to manage the change. Divide, develop that inspiring uh, vision. What does it mean? The vision, mission, the goal. Whether it's short, smaller scale now because we we have that unknown. So instead of thinking the three or the five year vision, mission and goal as an organization, we bring it forward one month, three months, six months, nine months, review continually, continually, continually. If, uh, if you get the opportunity of downloading the seven harbors of highly effective people, guys, habit number seven is, 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 is where sharpening the saw, where you review, refresh. So we on the front foot with change, empower others to enact vision, um, generate those shorter wins. Mm. These are the motivators. These are the things that you want to allow people to change their mindsets and change empathy is what we'll, we'll, we'll just quickly finish on. Um, but the acceleration. So when you go through change, make sure it's constant. It's not just done once stopped. That is continual because it's interdependent because the rest of the world is changing. So should you. Um, and, and then initiate that aspect of permanency within the change. Because where we aspire people to be is there. Ways to work with people when you better understand, when you understand them better is that change empathy. And thinking about the different aspects of, of mind, I can learn anything I want to. When I'm frustrated, I persevere. I want to challenge myself. When I fail, I learn. I tell, uh, tell me I try hard. Um, if you succeed, I'm inspired. My effort and attitude determine everything. Or I'm either good at it or I'm not. When I'm frustrated, I give up. I don't like to be challenged. When I fail, I'm not good. Tell me I'm smart. If you succeed, I feel threatened. My abilities determine everything. If we can change our mindsets, we have got much more of an aspect and a consideration of, um, of, of, of embracing um, um, or anything and everything that, 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 that lands on our lap, COVID being one. Okay. Good luck to everybody out there. I'm going to hand this over now for, <laughs> and I'm just going to quickly change the slide, Andrea. Yeah, the host of the thank you. Oops. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Wayne. Sorry, my internet connection went off a little bit earlier on. And if it does happen again, then, you know, bye for now. <laughs> um, but fingers crossed it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> Sorry, but, you could have warned me on that one, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I was just there and then I wasn't. Um as always, we've got um, time for q and I'm sure a few of you will have some questions. Please feel free to use the Q&A box or the chat box now. Um, Wynne's going to stick around for the next couple of minutes. Um, if you can't think of any questions at the minute, I'm sure we can definitely, um, you know, you can, you can contact me at the end or send me an email. I'll ping them over to you, Wynne, if that's all right. 100% okay, guys. Um, I don't want to yeah. put everyone on the spot at the minute, but please, if you do have any questions, feel free to use the chat and Q&A box now. Um, whilst you're having a little bit of a think, um, Wynne, if we could just go to the next slide, please. 100%, yep. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so ooh, if we just yeah, go back one. <laughs> oh, I, that's the same slide. Is it? it? Yeah. There, there we go. That's what we want to see. Um, okay, so more webinar news. As mentioned, this was our final uh, webinar of 2020. So thank you so much, Win, for stepping in and delivering that session. Um, it was a really fun one to end the year in. I think we needed it. Um, thank you for asking me. Yeah, and um, if you are interested in signing up to uh, find out more about what kind of webinars we are running, we try to we try to deliver them on a one or two week basis. From January onwards, though, we do have um, webinars scheduled in. So please do sign up to our training alerts to keep up to date with those at www.civilservicecollege.org.uk. And if we just go to the next slide there, please, Win. Oops. It's them. I'm an, anim, um, I'm an I'm getting rid of those now. Honestly, they need to go. <laughs> um, so as mentioned, we uh, we do have um, a couple of webinars coming up in January for you. Uh, the first one will be with our expert trainer, Joe Cliff, on how to get your voice heard in meetings. That's on Wednesday, the 13th of January. Um, and the one after that will be on Tuesday, the 19th of January on leading with impact and purpose with Keith Bleasdale. So please do go on our website if they sound like something that you'd be interested in. Feel free to register. They are completely free. Uh, we do have more webinars scheduled so just have a little look on our webinar page to see what is coming up but these are the first two in January in 2021 that you will see and um, if we can just go to the next slide there please that would be yeah. great fantastic and um, as you all know uh, we are on Facebook Instagram Twitter LinkedIn <laughs> and this recording will be put on our YouTube channel when um, it's finished so please do keep an eye out we will follow this up with an email and we'll send you the slides as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I can see that there's a few comments in the box there. Uh, yeah, thank you very much from Mandy. Yeah, Bethany, thank you. Great, no questions at the moment, but uh, yeah, brilliant. We'll strive to be an innovator and not an adapter. That's good, at least you can take away something from today, Debbie. Thank you so much. Yeah. Win, it's been a pleasure as always. I'm sure we'll hear from you very soon. Maybe um, maybe after this call, we'll have a um, record and we'll have a quick catch up. And yeah, yeah, we'll definitely get you back on board. Thank you so much. Can I just quickly say thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, some, some stuff coming in. And some, Debbie, thought, thought provoking. Um, yeah, just some really nice comments. Um, guys, stay safe, please, and have a very, very Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. And keep safe, stay connected, and have a lovely Christmas, and hopefully a big and brighter 2021. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, it's, it's needed, isn't it? Everyone's just exhausted now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Take it easy, everyone, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you.